Welcome, and thank you for standing by. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode until the question and answer session of today's conference. At that time, you may press star, then the number one on your phone to ask a question. I would like to inform all parties that today's conference is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. I would now like to turn the conference over to Deborah Denhart. Thank you. You may begin. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for today's webinar on site visits, voluntary disclosures, and enforcement actions. I'm Deborah Denhart with the U.S. Commercial Service. If you were with us earlier this month for the BIS in-depth webinar, you heard from BIS's Office of Enf Ex Export Enforcement, which provided a general overview of the scope of the OEE, partnership with industry, and the identification of red flags. Today's webinar will provide practical guidance on how to handle site visits, administrative, civil, and criminal investigations, and enforcement actions, as well as evaluating whether to voluntarily disclose potential or actual violations to the government. I do want to mention a few items before we start. We will have a Q&A session at the end of the program. If you want to ask a question, you can type a question into the Q&A box on the lower right-hand corner of your screen. And we also will be sending out the net replay following the presentation. Please note the list of webinars we're holding in August. I know many of you have already signed up for the entire series. For those who haven't, you may wish to register for some of the webinars listed on the screen. We are pleased to welcome back Alfredo Fernandez, an associate at the law firm of Shipman and Goodwin in Hartford, Connecticut. Thank you so much for joining us today, Alfredo. Thank you, Deborah, and welcome to everybody on the call from East Coast to West Coast or in between, and I think we actually had some international uh, attendees on the, the list today. Uh, so welcome all, and thanks for calling in. I think we'll jump right into it. Uh, Jumping off from Deborah's intro there, uh, we've heard from BIS uh, personnel at earlier sessions in this summer webinar series, some introductory, some more in-depth. And what today's session is designed to do is give you a private practice uh, perspective as to how to handle uh, some of the more touchy topics, such as enforcement, agents knocking at your door, uh, requesting to see your facility documents, whether online or hard copies, et cetera, and uh, really get a feel for what the consequences are of, of those kind of activities and if export violations are uncovered. One of the topics we'll also hit today is the disclosure avenue. And uh, sometimes when you discover these yourselves, regardless of whether the agency is is nearby or circling, uh, it can be beneficial to voluntarily disclose this and you know actively uh, bring your case to the government for their review. So we'll we'll hit all of the above uh, in the next hour or so, and and as Deborah mentioned, we'll have some Q and A time at the end. And I think as you should have access to type in a question as well. And sometimes I'm able to to catch those out of the corner of my eye while I'm speaking and address those as we're going. Um, if not, we'll take a look at them at the end as well. So I don't want to necessarily rehash the agenda uh, any more than I just did, but we'll start out with a, an overview of the various agencies and departments that are, are looking in the enforcement world uh, at the exporting community, uh, considerations for how to handle the visits, or doing your own internal investigations, uh, you know, in completely internally uh, with one party and, and no government involvement, and then how you're going to be evaluating whether a violation is worth a voluntary disclosure uh, preview. The answer is usually yes, uh, not always. And then we'll look at a few case studies, all within the last two, three months, uh, just to show you how active these are and the kinds of violations the government is enforcing. So this is meant to be a, a quick recap because at this point in the, the seminar series, you've at least uh, gotten somewhat familiar with these terms if you're not already very familiar with these terms. 
uh, but just as a, as a baseline for anyone uh, new to the group. The Export Administration regulations cover dual use goods and technology. And by dual use, I mean those that are applicable for civil and military utility. Uh, purely commercial items also covered by the EAR. And some items that have uh, could be considered military but have recently moved over to the purview of the EAR as part of export control reform. These are generally uh, housed in the what's called the 600 series of the EAR's commerce control list. Secondly, the International Traffic and Arms Regulations is specifically for military and defense articles, as well as uh, the technology that surrounds them. And uh, lastly, relevant to today is uh, OFAC and the sanctions programs, both country-based embargoes such as Cuba and Iran, and individual and prohibited party prohibited entity sanctions on, on people and entities regardless of country. So those are the, the major laws in play here, although there are a few others. Uh, but I did want to just throw up on the screen here all the various agencies, and actually this is not an exhaustive list, I had to trim a few just to make it a little more uh, convenient for the eyes. But it gives you an idea of how many different agencies with different scopes and different missions are looking and are active at some point in the enforcement process. And you know, no investigation is going to engage all of these particular groups, uh, but any investigation could involve uh, any single one, and a lot of times more than one agency. So no memorization test on this one, just an idea that there are a lot of moving pieces and different eyeballs looking at the enforcement and compliance world for industry. So as we pre previewed, we'll, uh, we'll get into the reviews or investigations uh, piece of this seminar uh, right off the bat here. We'll look at what site visits entail, how they should be formatted to the extent you can control that, uh, and how the focus assessments are, are looked at and, and how you could self-audit. We'll touch a little bit, not very long, on detentions and seizures and forfeitures. That's the government holding on to your property or the property of your customer, depending on when the um, custody shifts. Uh, and then we'll also hit some of the criminal aspects of this uh, topic that won't apply to a lot of you if there's no knowing and willful uh, violation, but good companies have gotten into criminal trouble uh, under certain circumstances, so it's worth briefly discussing how the criminal investigations look, and again, voluntary disclosures in, in any kind of scenario. So those of you that I hope have not had to deal with the site visit uh, much at all, in, and hopefully ever, but if it happens, it's a relatively normal and routine thing, but there are just way more companies and exporters than there are agents available to uh, perform inspections. They're generally uh, scoped to get in there, sense the compliance of this particular facility, uh, either help the company get into compliance or enforce the law if it finds violations, write those up or ask the company to disclose the violations themselves. A lot of times they are pretty broad in what they're going for for a particular visit. Uh, more particularly, though, we're seeing what's called the quick response audits or focused assessments that are, are geared specifically to certain issues, like the agent would be there to check a, a predetermined scope of work that only kind of covers part of export compliance as a general universe. Uh, it's just a, a trend we're seeing. There's no official mandate that it has to go that way, uh, but just keep in mind, it could be a pretty broad scope. It could be pretty narrow. And the next few slides are going to be our, our recommendations, you know, generally speaking, of how to structure the site visit should it occur at your facility. And, and these aren't hard and fast rules, but general framework that you may want to consider for your particular facility and circumstance. 
Uh, so first, I'll announce some of the, the programs that are, or lack of a better term, structures that are out there uh, for BIS and uh, DDTC uh, for EAR and ITAR respectively. Uh, for BIS specifically, they do uh, quite a bit of outreach and a, a lot of their mission is to, to do outreach uh, to the exporting community. Uh, OEE, the Office of Export Enforcement, is the primary site visit inspection department within BIS, although another uh, BIS entity does a, a lot fewer uh, but more targeted inspection. So generally speaking, the takeaway is OEE is probably the uh, agency involved in a visit, and you should be aware that they have badges and oftentimes they have firearms on their side. Uh, that's part of their law enforcement responsibility. Always a little frightening to see if you weren't expecting that today. Uh, Stats-wise, the latest I was able to find over 700 visits last year. You know, that's you know, roughly two a day across the country, so it's they're frequent activities. And they have field offices all over the United States, so each field office will focus on its uh, its region, and which is a, you know, a couple states at the max, and for some of the bigger states, it's only a, a portion of that state. So usually the, the agent visiting is somewhat local within a few hours' drive of you. Uh, but one thing we do want to flag here early on is that when you get these visits, you are conversing with a government official. If they point out some flaws in your compliance program or particular issues that they're identifying, and then somewhere down the road, they learn that that wasn't fixed or they did the same thing again, et cetera, they can and have uh, give you or recognize what's called imputed knowledge, meaning you, we gave you this knowledge and going forward, you know, we will look at you as if you had knowledge of these shortfalls and your requirements uh, from the date of that visit. So in a recent settlement, USA Shipping LLC, uh, BIS turned on the heat as part of the enforcement action and, and said it, this particular company knew of their requirements and violations specifically because of a prior visit. So you need to know that uh, expectations go up after a visit because they've had the opportunity to point out the requirements and the violations and the expectation going forward is that they'll be addressed. Now, shifting gears to the DDTC company visit program or CVP, which is relatively recently uh, resurrected. It went away for a while and uh, they briefed they re-jump started the program uh, around this time last year, if I remember correctly. The, the program has two, two sections or two objectives. One is this compliance type visit. At, on the first bullet there, you'll see the CVPC as it's often abbreviated. These are geared towards checking compliance and enforcing the rules. They're a little, if for lack of a better term, meaner for you. And uh, you need to be aware if it's a, a compliance visit, the objective is test the compliance of the particular facility. On the other hand, hopefully you're dealing with an outreach visit or the CVPO. And these are by design supposed to be friendlier, engaging the community, and actually teaching opportunities for the agency itself as well as the facility. The, the agents want to understand what the real world business in the private sector is going through, what challenges it's seeing so that when it goes back to DC, you know, through the whatever reporting channels they use, uh, policy can be tweaked accordingly if, if they're just seeing facility after facility, they're seeing the same issues where, where industry is struggling to, to stay compliant. Uh, and as most of you know, those that uh, export defense articles or manufacture defense articles, you're probably or should be registered with DDTC. Uh, so they have a, a master roster of, of registered entities and they'll uh, kind of randomly pick from their list there. I have a link 
to the CVP site, and it's not too hard to navigate to from the, the main pmddtc.state.gov website. Uh, it lays out a lot of this information in more detail uh, and what the, the visits entail in, in more details on one slide here. So if that's of interest to you, please go check that out on afterwards. Okay, so now we're going to get into your strategy or your recommended strategy for how to deal with, with a site visit. First phase we're going to look at is pre-inspection, kind of getting your house in order before you even get to the inspection phase. And maybe this is an exercise that gets done and no inspection ever happens. That's a good thing. Uh, but you'll be ready and it'll help you uh, get the, all your ducks in a row here. So first thing is just routine evaluation for overall compliance. Hopefully someone at your company, and this is obviously scaled to the, the size and sophistication of your enterprise, a, a 10 or 12 person company uh, may have one person that's doing export compliance and three other you know, responsibilities, a lot of hats to be worn. Uh, a larger company could have you know, dozens of people focused on export compliance, so it's scaled to your own company's needs. Uh, but doing a, a kind of a routine check ahead of time helps you be ready for an inspection should it ever come. If things are identified, whether they're, they're close to violations or it's a little gray, you want to address those internally uh, before the, the government is there over your shoulder finding those out at the same time. Uh, if you identify a violation, we will discuss your options later on in the presentation. Uh, ahead, before, again, before you're expecting an agency visit, you'll want to already have a predetermined company representative tagged as the person to deal with it. Uh, this is someone that's usually there, unless they're you know, sick or on, on holiday, knows the facility, where the different departments are, how to get in and out of doors, and if there's any you know, particularly unsafe spaces, how to avoid those, if, you know, depending on your manufacturing type setting. Uh, and this person would be available to accompany an inspector throughout the whole process. And in addition to that, your company should consider having written protocols for what to do during an inspection. So this designated person and his or her successor and their successor, et cetera, knows what the expectations are uh, when a visit happens, if it ever happens. Uh, this isn't a, an off-the-shelf you know, document. It's, you know, you're going to make it specific to your building, to your departments, to your technology, et cetera. Um, in addition, and not on the slide here, having a backup designee is a good idea because we've had clients, you know, do a lot of this with one person set to to be the visitor or the visitor's guide. That person was out today or on the particular site visit, and it was a little bit of a scramble on their end to to plug somebody in. So having some redundancy in that regard is recommended. Now, with the initial contact, sometimes these are scheduled, oftentimes they are unscheduled, uh, so you want to be uh, ready in case it, an unscheduled visit occurs. You First off, you check in your visitor by your normal uh, onboarding reception type uh, activities. If someone represents his or herself as an agent of the government, they are supposed to show the identification and, and qual. So you check the qualifications and credentials, you know, photocopy it if, if it feels appropriate. You don't have to, uh, but you should jot down in the visitor log that uh, an agent and uh, the exact name visited at, on this day. So it's there for your records. Ahead of time, uh, after your designee has, has been called to escort the particular agent visiting, or oftentimes it's two or three. Uh, you'll want to find a room uh, close to the reception area so there's not a lot of walking in between reception check-in and this conference room uh, and request a kind of a pre, pre walk through meeting to discuss, you know, why are you here, how long are we expected 
to be here? What is the goal of this uh, inspection? You, you tell us which which areas you're going to want to see. Uh, tell us what go, what uh, documents you want to see. Tell us what photographs you expect to be taking. Uh, and we, we say this ahead of, or we recommend doing this ahead of time because if you don't and and the agents get into your facility, you know, there's really no no boundary for what they were there to see. If you force them to tell you this is the scope of this visit, you have a little more control as to where that visit can go. Otherwise, you're giving them a, a free range of, of activities. Uh, and inspection opportunities, if they say we only want to look at, at documents A, B, and C, and we want to go check these particular machines where you're working on this particular uh, aircraft platform, then that's the scope of the visit, and you can hold them to that. Uh, we find that that's a, a helpful exercise ahead of time. Uh, sometimes the agents will, will play along if that's really, you know, they're okay with limiting their visit to those things. Uh, sometimes they'll like to reserve the opportunity to to stray from that path, and you kind of there's a little give and take there, and obviously you want to have a, as good a relationship with your uh, inspector as possible. Uh, if there's any special constraints for your facility, like a top secret uh, section where your agent may or may not have top secret clearance, uh, a particularly dangerous uh, area of, of manufacturing if personal protective equipment is required, that kind of thing could be addressed uh, if appropriate at the pre-meeting so they're, uh, they're apprised of what they may have ahead of them and what they won't be able to see that they were given uh, proper notice ahead of time. And as the last bullet, if, it's a, if it feels contentious or, or you have a bad feeling about it, uh, you have the right to request counsel uh, to be present, and if it's something where uh, a lawyer could arrive within a, a half hour or an hour, sometimes the agent, depending on his or her schedule, will agree to it or agree to come back another day uh, where counsel could be there. Uh, but it's, it's an option if you uh, feel like you should have a lawyer there to help guide the the visit or uh, you know say stop where it's appropriate to say stop. That's uh, that's an option for you. Not necessary uh, in all circumstances if you're, uh, you get the feeling that it's a, a relatively friendly type visit. It's a judgment call for your business. Now, moving into the actual inspection, the, your, um, your visitor's guide should, like I said before, be there uh, right next to the inspector. And if there's more than one inspector, ask them to stay together so they don't split up because one person can't follow two people. Uh, this person should be taking notes. This should be a, a contemporaneous record of what is going on. We started at A. We walked over to this section. We talked to Mike Smith and then Kevin Brown and et cetera. Uh, uh, you, obviously, there's going to be some security areas in your, your building, whether it's by key card access, you know, standard lock and key uh, type thing for cabinets, uh, but you, you as, the, as the guide or your guide for your company may um, want to be there, make sure the areas are appropriate for a visitor to, uh, to walk into. Um, and then if, if in the course of the visit you've been asked to provide documents that you find are, are privileged or protected from disclosure for any kind of reason, trade secret, uh, attorney-client privilege, uh, things like that. You can identify those particular documents to the, to the agent and say, I think there's some disclosure protections here. Uh, we'll make notes of, of what these are, and if we, you know, if we feel like we can give these to you, uh, we will after the visit. Uh, obviously, you want to be as respectful and transparent as possible. Uh, so, you know, put your foot down uh, only as appropriate. And uh, to that end, if you are handing over documents, and oftentimes 
that's you know most of what the visit is there for. Make sure you just make copies of everything you give, and usually they're okay with with um, collecting them as you go. But before the agents leave, you just make one big batch copy of of every document that was excuse me that was provided, just for the record, and and it'll go along with the guide's notes. Uh, sometimes they take photos, say uh, particular assemblies or parts are out in the open and there's a, a foreign national area, you know, 20 feet away, they'll just want to document how close this particular work piece was to a foreign national area uh, regarding potential releases of, of technical data. And, uh, that's just one random example, but sometimes photos are taken. Uh, it's appropriate for your guide to, to take the same photo that your agents are taking just to uh, keep it in, in the record internally. All right. So after, after you're done, you can take them back to that same conference room or office that you started in for the pre-meeting, and you'll want to see if they'll, they can give you a copy of the inspection report right there if they were going down a checklist or template, which they often carry. Uh, Sometimes they say they'll send you one within a week or 10 days or whatever, which is acceptable. If they are, if they have time, and sometimes it goes to the end of the day and, and you don't have time or they don't have time, but it's a good idea to uh, discuss the findings right there. So they have to make an initial assessment of your compliance. So you don't have to wait a week to hear, oh, we found 12 violations just throughout our walk. Uh, it puts a little pressure on them to make a make a call and say, here's what we found, here's what we're going to do, and here's what we recommend you do to continue improving your compliance. And then you have, obviously you're documenting all of this through your notes, uh, so you can have uh, on paper what the inspector said he or she found, what the inspector recommended for immediate corrective actions, if that's the case, uh, and you have notes that if they say you have to file a disclosure by October 31st, uh, that's written down and, and hard as a reminder for you. Uh, and the last bullet kind of overlaps with what I've already said, so we'll, we'll keep on moving here. All right, and after you've, you've said goodbye to your uh, agent, what's next? You want to, or your internal procedure should probably have a debrief process. Who gets debriefed is completely up to the, the appropriate structure for your company, whether you have an in-house lawyer, uh, an outside counsel that would normally get some of these uh, facts while they're fresh in the, the same day or the next day. And you w may want to consider generating a memo to your your internal file, just documenting all those notes and and attaching the photos, et cetera. Uh, so that's all in there. You know, you have a date stamp of of inspection date or the following day, so it's contemporaneous with the um, the actual inspection and not weirdly, you know, created three weeks later where memories start to blur. Uh, if you had agreed or promised to send the inspector some things after the visit, you want to follow up on that so they're not waiting and twiddling thumbs waiting for you to, to send the documents. Uh, if you discuss some, some minor or major violations uh, during the visit and, and you promise to correct or remediate some of the issues, you want to obviously do those quickly. Uh, and then submit proof that it was done. And obviously this is a, an area where you may really want legal uh, counsel depending on the, the voluntary disclosure or whether this was a, a mandated disclosure correction. Uh, there may be some legal issues you'd want to consider there. Uh, short answer is uh, make sure you follow through with any promises and just document in good time um, what the visit entails. Uh, 
All right. So the next – apologies for – there's a little lag on my, my slide changing. The um, internal audits or internal assessments are a useful tool. They're, they come with some pros and some cons. Uh, but more often than not, they teach you something uh, about your company that's good to know before a, an agency visit occurs. It prepares your team for a real inspection. If you're kind of mocking what a or not, uh, yeah, like mocking a, a real inspection, uh, you go through similar walkthroughs. You kind of quiz your people. You uh, audit your electronic document systems, uh, and oftentimes these are done by a third-party assessor. Um, so it would be, you know, quote unquote, a stranger coming in and and asking some questions, and your your designated guy can get used to following a, a third party through the through the facility, practice taking the notes, uh, practice disseminating the information. Uh, the issue with, with audits is that it's going to result in a report more often than not. And uh, if that report happens to document a bunch of violations, you're, that's going to be in your system somewhere. So if the government, you know, at some later date asks for your records or, or results from prior audits, you're going to have this document that may not be the most flattering uh, piece of literature for you. So we often recommend doing this through counsel. It'll be a, a legal relationship in, in counsel advising uh, the company. The agent, or I'm sorry, the attorneys can engage the, uh, the assessors or the auditors to help guide legal counsel. Uh, so then you have some leverage of the attorney-client privilege available. Uh, it's not foolproof, and there's some gray area as to what's covered and what's not. Uh, so that would be something to, to discuss further with counsel. Uh, if the audit or assessment uncovers violations, that's when you want to consider whether a voluntary disclosure is appropriate. And usually finding it on your own uh, initiative. You've done this without any government agency telling you to, to go audit is a very good mitigating factor and, and part of the overall story uh, when you do voluntary, voluntarily disclose. So we'll get into a few more of those considerations later. Uh, and lastly, really, the, a, a big takeaway is that if you address deficiencies during the audit and your own internal assessment phase, um, they won't pop up, hopefully, during a government inspection, and, and those violation slash problems are, are non-issues. So I think I have maybe just one or two slides on on this topic, detention, seizures, and forfeitures. Now, the U.S. Customs and Border Protection and OEE have the authority to inspect your shipping documents and search containers uh, at border crossings, uh, ports of entry uh, in both directions, in and out of the United States, and airports. There are different define terms for um, for the level of, of takings, so to speak. A forfeiture is a, somewhat on the extreme side where a property becomes the property of the federal government. That's relatively rare and safe for some extenuating circumstances. Uh, more common are seizures where they'll, the government will hold property until some kind of uh, penalty is paid or some kind of shipping and documentation fee is taken care of. Uh, th they could also just hold it, uh, reject the shipment altogether and send it back to sender uh, or put it in a bonded warehouse until whatever noncompliance that was identified is remediated. So if uh, any of those happen, you'll want to engage legal counsel as well to help guide that process. Uh, and make sure you are on a path to, to moving your shipment appropriately and, and addressing any uh, holdups. For border crossings, there is 
no warrant necessary. Uh, that frequently you see articles about people's phones and bags being searched at the airport, same type of deal. Uh, they're just a, a heightened need in the eyes of the government to have more thorough vetting and checking at border crossings. So uh, the requirements of presentation uh, or reasonable uh, kind of search preferences kind of goes away. And that's a, you subject yourself to that and your shipments subject themselves to that uh, while crossing borders. In the recent years, we have seen an uptick in reviews of EAR 99 containing shipments. The government was concerned that too many people were, were calling their things EAR 99 and uh, claiming that no license is required for particular destinations, which often is very true. Uh, but in some cases, they, they wanted to um, come down a little harder on people that were a little too loose with that designation. Um, and if something has a, a specific ECCN as opposed to the EAR 99 catch-all, um, to the extent a license would have been required, some of the, um, the focus by customs has, has gone there. I don't know how long that trend will last, uh, especially with administrative changes in DC, but it's something to be aware of that if you are using EAR 99, uh, make sure you're supposed to be using it. And then tying back a little bit to one of the prior uh, seminars in this series, the destination control statement language was updated late last year. Uh, customs will be looking at commercial invoices, et cetera, during the shipping process, and that's an easy thing for them to, uh, to ding somebody on if, if that's missing or it should be there, et cetera. Those slides and things are available through the, the U.S. Commercial Service if if you need them, and I'm happy to present a copy of the slides via email if, if you missed that one. Uh, I see a, a question that came up on, on the Q&A on my end anyway. The question was, can an enforcement agent uh, such as OEE take pictures without a subpoena or a search warrant? Uh, if during a visit it's a, a little bit of a, a gray area because You've invited the um, the agent into your property, uh, so you kind of you don't have much to to stand on in terms of denying them a photo if it's part of their customary inspection procedures. Uh, usually, it's just to to document something that's hard to write down in a way that's meaningful. Uh, if the the visual documentation is going to be more uh, useful down the road for records. Uh, than trying to write some kind of spatial relationship, et cetera. So uh, they usually are allowed to, to take photos if they, if it's part of the, the natural kind of inherent scope of the, the visit, if they start getting into individual files or security rooms and things like that, uh, you can get into some gray areas to what's, what's inappropriate and what's out of the scope of our of a regular visit. But I hope that answers your question or question, Beth. Okay, so we're gonna shift a little bit into criminal investigations and because this is going to affect almost none of you and at best one or two of you, I'm not going to spend too much time on it. Usually the people attending, diligently attending, you know, training webinars are not the people committing export criminal violations. So uh, there are uh, different elements and vehicles for prosecutors and investigators to use while you're under a criminal investigation, uh, such as uh, search warrants in this case uh, can be warranted uh, for documents even with this can be outside of the scope of a visit altogether. Uh, uh, stings are a, another interesting and kind of movie-worthy movie, movie worthy type of activity that they do. OEE is pretty good about their sting procedure, and they'll 
they'll set up a fake buyer, uh, you know, a fake company, and start doing emails and really get into uh, a character to set up uh, a particular export violation. And when the violation occurs, in come the guys with badges and guns, and it's great. It's just how you would picture it in the movies. Uh, similarly, but less uh, less theatrical, our, our undercover pretext visits. Uh, sometimes the agents will come in in a kind of somewhat of a friendly way. Hey, we were in the area checking out another uh, facility. We thought since we hadn't visited you, we'd come check and see what you're about. And, you know, that puts your guard down automatically. But really, the whole goal of the entire visit was to see you the whole time. Uh, to check out some specific uh, suspicions there. So that technique we've seen uh, time and time again. Uh, though as a proportion of, of all voluntar or voluntary and friendly and outreach visits, it's pretty low. And it's usually uh, specific to companies that are, are suspected of doing something purposely wrong. Uh, so if you have a good compliance program and uh, are doing things above board, you will most likely not be a target for this kind of undercover visit. Uh, subpoenas, again, that's a, a request to either have someone from the company appear in person to testify and or produce documents on, on the given topic. So if you receive a, a subpoena, highly recommend you get counsel on uh, right away. Uh, we have a, a few good faith companies all over the country that, for whatever reason, are identified as someone that receives a subpoena from the government, and we'll, we'll step through the process there, interface with a particular prosecutor or investigator, make sure the scope is appropriate, and help everybody get the documents uh, where they need to be and appropriately. And then just as a, a side note, the FISA warrants, these are uh, a little tricky. They don't have to be. Um, they're a little secretive in nature, and you can uh, a prosecutor can get these from a judge or a court uh, in secret, so there's a, a little less transparency. But these are reserved for uh, special national security type issues, which are sometimes leveraged in in these export enforcement uh, cases. Uh, so the uh, the bar to get a visa warrant is somewhat high, uh, so it's. It's a rare occurrence, but it's out there, so I wanted to, uh, to throw it on the slide for you. Uh, so a, a couple tips on internal investigations. If you decide that before any of these government investigations happen, I want to take care of my house myself, uh, you'll want to triage your your issues. If you know you have, you know, 30 problems, let's focus on on the most important ones. Uh, and you want to you want to be strategic about how you excuse me set this up. Like I mentioned, if it makes sense for you to use outside counsel to get a, a third party assessment specialist in there, uh, it, that works. It, obviously, if you can handle this in house, go for it. Uh, you want, but either way, you want to protect as much privileged information as you can. If there are attorney-client privileged documents floating around out there, uh, you want to tailor the scope appropriately. Uh, interestingly, you want to be you want to be careful about what you write on paper. Uh, so consider whoever is writing the report, whether it's a third party. Uh, auditor or whether your in-house quality team is doing it, uh, just be mindful of, of the writing uh, because that could be discovered in, in any kind of future proceeding, hopefully not an issue. Uh, and some interesting issues we've seen recently with, with clients is that they'll, they're checking their foreign national uh, workforce, at whether in the United States or, or abroad, and asking for uh, documentation to, to prove U.S. person status or prove visa status to whatever foreign nationality they are in the system as. And depending on where you are, there could be some employment harassment issues and there can be some data privacy 
uh, issues, especially in the EU and Canada. Um, so be mindful of of how far is too far when when asking some of those nationality questions. All right. So we'll uh, we'll get into the disclosure phase of of the slide deck here. There are two types of disclosures, mandatory and voluntary. Of the mandatory variety, there are a few instances where you have an affirmative obligation to disclose within a certain time frame. Uh, under the ITAR, if you discover a violation of a, an unauthorized export to a country listed in Section 126.1, you are obligated to disclose that to the government. Uh, Again, if you discover uh, a restrictive trade practice or boycott issue yourself under the EAR, uh, 760.5 requires you to disclose that. Uh, and the third, and probably more common, or I don't know, maybe the first or third are more common, the um, a directed disclosure. And that means the government has said, you need to write up a disclosure and send it to us as soon as possible or by X date. Uh, Unfortunately, in, in that scenario, you're not going to get the benefit of voluntarily disclosing a violation. The document will look more or less the same in terms of what are the facts, what happened, what do we correct, um, but you won't get that added benefit of we brought this to you voluntarily to help mitigate the penalties. So all the, the three mandatory disclosures are, are not, uh, not good but they can be managed. On the, the bottom half of the slide here, the voluntary disclosures that are much more common uh, can, uh, from both the ITAR and EAR and the NOFAC issue, uh, address potential or actual violations. Uh, for example, with the ITAR, potential access is considered access under, uh, well, based on recent guidance in the last several five, six years, so if you find, you know, a shortfall in your electronic security that a foreign national employee or, or contractor or customer could have access to ITAR controlled data, we can show that they didn't, but the, the door was open for them if they knew where to look. Uh, that could be considered a violation uh, by nature of its potential uh, to have been a violation. So. Uh, Obviously, it's a helpful fact to be able to say we can prove through X, Y, and Z logging, et cetera, that it didn't happen. Uh, or if you don't have as robust a, a logging or access capability, you can say there's no reason uh, why that person would have been looking in this particular folder. Uh, but keep in mind that potential violations uh, may be appropriate to disclose. And obviously, actual violations are are undoubtedly real violations, so those should definitely be uh, in the running for a disclosure. Uh, I generally recommend a voluntary disclosure when something, uh, a violation is found. Uh, though there, you know, there are some things to consider, like how egregious is the violation and what are the benefits and drawbacks of this violation. Uh, I could be guaranteeing a, a penalty if it's particularly bad, uh, if it's if there's a paper trail that the violation was knowing and willful by one particular employee of your company, uh, you know there's a very decent chance that when the government reads that it'll start looking into a more criminal uh, level investigation, uh, more geared toward a particular individual if they they went rogue so to speak. Uh, but that's a risk you want to evaluate. Not very common. Uh, most people are trying to do the right things but just weren't aware of what they were doing or thought they were doing it right or uh, something was typed in wrong. Uh, so if it's a pretty minor paper uh, mix-up, you know, the, the wrong ECCN was typed and uh, otherwise the procedure was followed to a T, those kind of things uh, will be generally forgivable by, by either agency and, uh, and won't be too much of a drawback for you to disclose. Um, Timing-wise, you want to uh, make sure you can, you can handle the, 
the timing windows. Uh, so, for example, if you file an initial notification with, with either agency, and that's a, a short, you know, one or two or three page document laying out the very basic facts, uh, not getting into much detail, but just alerting the government that, hey, as of this date, we had voluntarily brought this to you, and and we'll get back to you within, you know, X days. And ITAR requires, uh, I think, 60 or 90 days, and I'm, I'm blanking on the, what the exact date is, for you to follow up with your final. And the BIS gives you 180 days between your initial and your final. So you want to keep in mind staffing uh, and capacity for, for running down the investigation, writing it all up, and submitting it on time. Uh, another consideration for timing is if you've just had a, uh, a similar violation within the last year or you found two, or you keep finding two or three more violations within the first few weeks of finding the first violation and they're kind of related, uh, you can make a strategic decision to, to lump them together if it's uh, looking to be the same cause that's, that's leading to the violation. So you can, you can delay or advance uh, appropriately based on the facts there. And obviously you want to take a, some clients are he very hesitant to, to bring a, an uh-oh to the government. Uh, one thing you want to consider in that kind of company is what are the risks of of not disclosing? Are, are you a high risk of getting a site visit? Uh, have you disclosed within the last six months or a year? Uh, because if so, you may be on a short list of, of companies to receive a visit. Uh, and if they do and you've had this new violation and, and opted not to disclose the second time, uh, it's not going to look good if you consciously did not uh, voluntarily disclose and, and the government finds out about it. So a lot of considerations, but at the end of the day, most fact patterns support a voluntary disclosure, and I'll get into some uh, more detail in the, the coming slides as to why uh, a voluntary disclosure is uh, helpful. And I, I thought I had a slide, but I, I must have um, not included it. So. Last year, I sat on a panel with a, a BIS agent and a, and a DDTC agent, as opposed or on the topic of, of voluntary disclosures and how they look at these. And they they gave some stats. So for fiscal year 2015, BIS had about 380 voluntary self disclosures submitted. Two thirds of those were closed with an issuance of a warning letter, which is uh, a, a short one or two page letter saying, we agree this is a violation, you've been warned, this letter will stay in your file, uh, you know, continue improving your compliance. Another 16% were closed with a no action letter or a letter of no violation, which is even better. That's where the government says, we, we've seen this, we don't think it's a violation, um, continue doing a good job and, and, and evolving your compliance program. So between those two numbers, we're looking at 80 plus percent of these uh, result in, in uh, a slap of, of the wrist or nothing more. Uh, really the only, the other 16, 15 percent get into um, a more serious consequence and that can get referred to the DOJ for a potential criminal investigation, Department of Justice, um, or it, it was just disclosed to the wrong agency, so they'll boot it out, um, or BIS will agree that this this requires some kind of administrative or civil penalty, um, and they'll they'll put a dollar figure on these violations. Uh, they take these seriously. Each one of these disclosures gets investigated. Sometimes it's just a, a desktop exercise. Uh, sometimes the, the disclosure is what triggers a visit, so keep that in mind. Uh, similarly, that was BIS. Find my notes here. Uh, DDTC 
had over three times as many disclosures in, in fiscal year 15, uh, over 1,100 disclosures. Uh, so just in, just to give you an idea of of volume and proportion, DDTC had a lot more, uh, and I attribute that to uh, a some are required, you know, under 126.1 countries, uh, but also every country in the world pretty much needs a license under the ITAR. Uh, so there's a lot more uh, a lot more transactions that would require an export license. Uh, and therefore, a lot more opportunity to get it wrong. Uh, whereas the BIS, uh, you do your analysis, your commerce uh, country chart may say this particular country doesn't need a license, uh, or there's an exception that applies that you take advantage of. So, just based on the licensing volume, um, I attribute that to to a big part of the uh, the difference in numbers. And as I mentioned before, the potential access is another issue for ITAR that's less applicable to the uh, the EAR. Uh, so even uh, instances where potential access uh, under the EAR control technology may not have been uh, worthy of, of a true violation and a disclosure. So all those added together, uh, you know, kind of make substantiate that difference. Uh, and again, with with ITAR, a lot of times the end result is that they'll close it, they'll confirm it's a penalty, but they won't administer or they'll, they'll confirm it's a violation, rather, but they won't administer a penalty. Um, so you can have some happy endings with a DDTC disclosure as well. Now, moving on to some recent en enforcement actions, and I'm not going to, I purposely kept these detailed, or these bullets not very detailed because nobody wants to slog through all the, the multi-page uh, settlement agreements and things like that. But just to give you a flavor of what, it's June 8th is the earliest one here. So less than two months ago, all the following slides uh, became published. Uh, one involving access communications in Massachusetts. There was uh, exports of a thermal imaging camera, and these aren't, you know, your everyday camera. These are hardcore $400,000 cameras uh, were sent to Mexico without a license. Uh, where a license was required. They tried to use an exception uh, that was inappropriate. They didn't uh, keep records of it appropriately as well. Um, so those violations uh, settled out to 700 k on a civil penalty. And as part of the settlement agreement, Axis agreed to mandatory third-party auditors uh, to come in. And that's probably going to uh, bubble up some more violations because a lot of audits do that. Uh, so they may be faced with, um, you know, disclosing even more violations in the next few months. So not a good look for the company. Uh, moving on, Cryomec in New York uh, settled an agreement the next day. Uh, one only one violation, and it was uh, an export to Russia. This was a much smaller scale one, so it was only a $28,000 penalty. Uh, but again, here they were they were required to bring in a third party auditor, uh, which, as I mentioned before, is probably going to you know churn up a couple more violations uh, during that process. Uh, this was a case of an individual, Hassan Zafari, in California. Uh, exactly a month ago today, this was settlement agreement was published. Uh, one violation, he uh, purposely was helping arrange a an export of a laser system to Iran, uh, put in wrong information on forms, and I'm surprised they didn't bump this up to a criminal investigation, but they settled them on the civil side at 52, and what could be a, a death sentence for a business is a, a denial order, meaning he can't take part in any export from the United States for for two years in this case. So uh, if you're fully dependent on an exporting market, uh, consider what two years without the ability to export could do for you. And now switching to a few sanctions uh, violations, and sanctions are, 
are pretty hot. And you, I, being in this world, I see new ones come in like every week or two. Uh, again, June 8th, not long ago, an American Honda finance entity entered into a settlement agreement. One of their Canadian entities was uh, was engaging with the Cuban embassy in Canada to arrange cars for, for Cuban diplomats. Uh, you'll see it's a pretty steep uh, penalty just for you know, arranging cars, right? Uh, but the details are also in the link below if you care to, to take a peek. Uh, AIG, or American International Group, is a company you probably recognize again. Uh, again, a month ago here, 555 alleged violations of sanctions programs. Different countries, uh, Iran, Cuba, uh, Sudan, Syria, North Korea, pretty much you name it. Uh, they were ensuring shipments that were going through prohibited countries uh, or involving uh, specially designated nationals or otherwise blocked persons. They were trying to use an OFAC uh, exclusion clause, which is some language recommended to uh, CYA, so to speak, and um, they didn't use it correctly and, and as a kind of a finance uh, company here, uh, got dinged. Given the amount of violations, the civil penalty is, is pretty small, uh, but because, you know, they weren't actively as engaged, you know, they were really just insuring property. I, I'm sure they got some um, some relief on the penalty because it could have been a lot, lot higher for 555 uh, violations. And, and lastly, one that's getting a lot of headlines this week, just came out a, a week ago, that's why, uh, is a $2 million civil penalty, penalty for ExxonMobil. Uh, they, they entered into eight contracts with uh, with a, a blocked person uh, from a Russian entity. So the, uh, the individual was a prohibited party, as alleged, and then the, the entity involved was Rosneft OAO, and they are an entity on what's called the Sectoral Sanctions Identifications List, uh, which is specific to the Russia-Ukraine uh, world of sanctions, and uh, that was kind of double trouble for ExxonMobil. Exxon has announced that it's going to dispute the penalty, which it has an administrative opportunity to do, uh, but it was a big one, even though for how much money ExxonMobil makes, this is probably a, a minor rounding error on their bottom line, uh, but of reputational purposes, uh, it was a big hit for them. So uh, the point of, of these last few slides was just to show you that enforcements are happening on a, a weekly, biweekly basis through a variety of agencies, um, and they're real. You saw some kind of small companies, somewhat smaller uh, penalties in the 30 to 50,000 range, and obviously the bigger companies are, are dealing with a lot heavier uh, penalties. Within the past few years, we've seen uh, combined penalties break a billion dollars, which was, were interesting in, uh, within the last year or so. so those were combination enforcements between three or four different government agencies and, and were put together uh, these major, major penalties, broke a billion dollars. So it was, uh, uh, may not impact most of the, uh, the audience today, but um, it's, a, it's a hot area for enforcement and, and uh, even scaled down to a, a small one to 500 uh, person company or, or really a, a much smaller one, under 100. Uh, it's a a force to be reckoned with, and you just want to be prepared as best you can. So I think we'll open it up to some some Q and A's. Thank you, Alfredo. And operator, uh, do we have any any questions in the queue? And just a reminder to our participants, uh, you can just press star one um, to ask a question. There are currently no questions in the queue. Please stand by. Okay. Thank you.
I'm showing no audio questions at this time. Okay, thank you, operator. Well, thank you so much, Alfredo, again, for sharing your insights. And uh, we look forward to everyone joining us on the next webinar, and have a great afternoon. That concludes today's conference. Thank you for your participation. You may disconnect at this time.